Good morning, and thank you for joining us today on our first webinar, which takes a look at BSI's BIM solutions. My name is Charlotte Brody. I work at BSI as the Construction and Personal Safety Propositions Manager, and I'll introduce you to everyone on the panel today. So we have Andy Butterfield, BSI's Global Head of Construction for Product Certification. Andy's responsible for building and leading our team of certification professionals to deliver excellence to clients within the construction sector and is very much involved in developing solutions for this sector as well. And we're also joined by Gary Patterson, our certification manager with in-depth knowledge of auditing companies who are looking to underpin verification for one of the key standards around BIM. And we are also joined from Australia by Rebecca DiCicco. Rebecca is the director of Digital Node she has an architectural background and a significant track record with her involvement in BIM, and in particular, her focus on knowledge sharing for BIM around the world. So the slide in front of you is today's agenda. And for the benefit of those who are less familiar with BSI, we're going to introduce you to who we are and what we do. And then we'll walk you through our journey in developing and shaping certification, followed by a closer look at the technical detail. I'll then walk you through the commercial and practical advantages behind choosing verification and Rebecca DiCicco will then talk to you about the training solutions and we'll then round off with questions and further support from BSI. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Andy who's going to talk you through our role in supporting BIM and our certification solutions. Uh, good morning everybody, um, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, uh, as Charlotte's mentioned, uh, my part in the presentation will be to take you through um, some of the work we've been undertaking over the last sort of, year and a half really with developing um, some solutions to, to help with implementation of BIM. Um, before I actually get into talking around the uh, specifics of, of BIM solutions, um, just to really to introduce you to the BSI group and how we're structured for those of you that are not so familiar with the group. We operate underneath a, a Royal Charter, uh, as you can see on the screen in front of you. Uh, we have uh, a number of uh, businesses within the, the group um, and the one that you'll be probably most familiar with is BSI as the national standards body in the UK. We have a, a very strict uh, governance structure around the national um, standards body um, and it acts independently from our commercial operations which are assessment, uh, uh, the, assess the assessment part of our business, certification and the training services along with compliance and support and advisory services. Right, to take you through a little bit of background around the the, uh, the, the development of standards um, over the last few decades. Um, the standards landscape has been changing significantly over, over the years since uh, BSI was first founded in 1901. Um, the, the primary focus when, when BSI was first developed was heavily upon product um, standards. Um, so the things like the BSI kite mark have traditionally been uh, associated with uh, traditionally been associated with um, building products such as windows, doors, cement and concrete. However, um, we then saw uh, in the 1950s a shift towards um, more business process standards. So this is where development of ISO 9000 and 14001 became uh, very um, important um, and a, a key area of our business. Of late, what we have seen is a move uh, towards what we would call business potential standards uh, and these are really outline how organisations uh, wish to demonstrate their behaviour and their corporate policy. Uh, these include things like anti-bribery, cor corporate social responsibility, collaborative business relationships and also building information modelling sits within this group of standards. These days BSI has, uh, has extensively extended its global footprint uh, and um, we, we have a, a significant global presence now in some 172 countries with offices in, uh, in 75 of those countries. We have 80,000 clients worldwide and operate from three main hubs. Uh, 
so in the US, we our central hub is in Reston, Virginia. As we move uh, to the EMEA region, our central hub there is in, in London and move into the Asia Pacific region, where as you'll see on the screen, we have a significant uh, presence uh, in this particular region. Our central hub is Hong Kong. So to explore um, some of our credentials before I get into, into discussing BIM particularly, as you'll, you'll see, we have, uh, as an organization, we've been a, uh, around for 115 years and the common theme through all of the, uh, that time is, is actually working in collaboration to support industry in achieving excellence. Um, you can see on your screen some of, some of those credentials quantified. So moving on to BIM, uh, I know that many of you listening today uh, will already know the answer to, um, uh, to what is BIM, so just bear with me as I explain uh, to some of the listeners that are not so familiar with BIM really what it is and uh, what's happening particularly in the UK. So let's start with the problem because actually BSI uh, originally back in 1901 was, was actually conceived from solving an industry problem uh, in that uh, there was a need for more product standards uh, particularly in the infrastructure sector to reduce the number of rail tracks, uh, different sizes and gauges so they could, uh, you know, there was more consistency in the, in the marketplace. So looking at BIM and the problem that uh, BIM is trying to solve, uh, not so long ago as you'll see on the screen, um, it wasn't uncommon for new buildings to have, have been drawn two and a half times and constructed one and a half times. Um, so going back over uh, the, you know, the, the decades really the construction sector uh, has had some issues with uh, poor value and poor productivity. Um, so BIM is actually you know, a solution to increasing um, efficiency in the construction sector, reducing waste and uh, improving outputs. So looking at a key, key milestones, um, 2016 uh, as many as you will know is a particularly a key year really for for uh, for BIM implementation in the UK. Um, from the 4th of April uh, this year, government HM government has, has uh, put a condition of contract in place that um, that, that uh, if you're looking to tender for a, a public project, then you'll you'll need to be able to do that using BIM technology and level two BIM. Uh, there is a second date uh, which you need to mark in your diaries which is October 2016 where there has recently been an announcement from government that uh, there's an additional requirement uh, around the, the capability uh, to electronically have BIM information uh, delivered from the supply chain. So a rather poignant year, uh, a rather busy year uh, ahead, particularly as we are in very, very close to the 4th of April. Um, so looking at what BIM actually is, um, it sounds like a silly question, what is BIM, but actually uh, we, in our experience as we've, we've spent time in different markets, not just the UK, it is a question that, that comes up quite regularly and um, quite often there's a, a miscomprehension that actually BIM is uh, just all about the, the, the software, which is, is far from the case. Um, BIM essentially, when you strip back um, the, the, the software particularly, is really around using modern technology uh, such as multi-dimensional digital tools uh, and visual models to actually just achieve increased collaboration within the construction sector. So putting it simply, um, think of BIM really as just sharing of data uh, by multiple parties all engaged uh, in, from, from the supply chain in constructing uh, a, 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 a project, a building or an infrastructure project. And it covers from cradle to grave really, so from design and construction through to operation through to deconstruction. Um, so really put simply, uh, it, it's really BIM is around the right information getting to the right people in the right format uh, at the right time. I mentioned earlier on the, the cartoon slide around the, the challenges the construction sector faces and why BIM is so important. Um, this really sort of is quantified by um, the fact that government has undertaken some, um, some research uh, in recent years to look at the benefits of using BIM technology and uh, it, 
the studies have found that on average per project um, savings of up to 20% are generally recognized um, through the use of BIM technology. So yeah, this really explains why particularly the UK is taking the lead on BIM imp implementation. Uh, there's significant savings and, and significant uh, efficient, uh, efficiency improvements. So moving on to our role, uh, BSI's role, looking at two two perspectives here really um, in supporting BIM. Firstly, as a national standards body, we've been heavily involved um, with the standards making process. Um, and um, also from a certification point of view, which I'm going to go on to explain a little more around shortly, uh, we've been heavily involved with engaging with uh, key stakeholders in shaping solutions that help with, with assurance through uh, certification. Um, so really what BSI's position is in supporting uh, this industry change is the same as, as it's always been really, which is, uh, is looking to work to add value and, and create solutions which are rele relevant to the marketplace to help with implementation. So looking at the, um, the slide in front, you, you have a visualization there of what the BIM Level 2 toolkit uh, consists of. Uh, and this is a really important slide to consider as we move through the rest of the presentation because level two constitutes quite a number of different standards and covers uh, issues from cap the capital phase, so design and construction, moving through to facilities management and also looking at the, the issues around information security. And all of these standards are underpinned by some of the, the other supporting standards standards you'll see there such as BS 1192, the COBE standard, uh, and BS 1192, 2007, which is the underlying principles of collaborative working. Um, so it's important to consider that the level two landscape from a standards perspective is rather broad and rather more extensive than just design and construction. So to take you through our journey, um, from a certification point of view, um, we started mapping uh, with stakeholders uh, the, the journey ahead and on how BSI could help with, with designing and implementing solutions, uh, as I said, around about uh, a, a year ago. And what we found is um, that um, working collaborative stakeholders, we drew up uh, four key, absolutely key objectives. Um, the first of which was actually if BIM is around collaboration, uh, essentially it would be uh, highly beneficial to take a collaborative approach with industry stakeholders to shape the certification solutions that they, f that they felt were needed in the marketplace. The second point was it's obviously very, very important that we align with re the relevant standards and regulations and conditions of contract um, to provide market access. After all, that's what certification aims to do. The third point uh, we found very important as we travelled region, region uh, is, is it's really key to have alignment with, um, with uh, a, a, our global location so we create effectively a global passport to, to trade in the construction sector. And the final point there is we needed to shape and need to shape solutions which add value to everybody in the supply chain. The next slide you'll see is just uh, to give you, you an indication of how busy we've been over the last few, uh, the last few months uh, here in the UK, um, working collaboratively with uh, key stakeholders to shape the solutions, but also move around the world in our global offices. Um, now um, I'm going to move on to tell you a little bit about the output from all that collaboration and the solutions that we have shaped for certification. So most importantly, uh, looking at the issues for this year and the condition of contract that's driven by the uh, PQQ uh, PAS 91 was the burning issue around particularly demonstrating compliance with PAS 1192-2. And with the stakeholders, we have developed and launched uh, what's called the BSI Verified Design and Construction uh, Certification Scheme. And this marks a, a big step forward, but just uh, one part of a longer journey as we provide solutions um, for BIM in the marketplace. 
Uh, my colleague that's speaking after me will tell you a little more about the, in, the, the structure of that, that scheme and how we've built that scheme. Secondly, uh, and a key area of further development is in the development of a BSI kite mark to support BIM, which is uh, being developed with um, stakeholders. For those of you that are not familiar with the, the BSI kite mark, it's, it was, it's owned by BSI and was created in 1903, and it's a tool for providing assurance, differentiation, and trust. And actually has been awarded um, as a, a recognized super brand for numerous years now, including 2016. Interesting, you'll see on the screen in front of you a quote from Ban Construction, who are one of our, um, our, our certification uh, customers who we launched the scheme with. So this is a, a, a future project. One of the issues that has come up time and time again as we've been involved in discussions um, here and around the world, particularly around BIM, is the need to actually support um, and align with existing system certification. The PAS 1192 is clearly a, a, a deep subject matter, uh, but actually when you uh, look at the standard, there is natural alignment with ISO 9000 and particularly with uh, collaborative working. So for us at BSI, um, particularly for the kite mark, we are looking to build the kite mark using a, a foundation uh, from uh, existing system certification. And it's, it's felt that actually this will help with understanding and implementation of, of BIM, particularly down the supply chain. So to talk through the slide that you can see on your screen now about how the overall architecture of our certification uh, scheme uh, is built up, you'll see if we start at the bottom of the slide, you'll see the verification solution, which is our tool really its primary purpose is speed to compliance. So to be able to empower organizations to demonstrate that they meet the requirements of PAS 91 and, and particularly have the processes in place for PAS 1192-2. Moving up the pyramid, I've just mentioned about using uh, existing system certification as uh, a foundation to support the kite mark and we're currently working with stakeholders to, to create more alignment with those, those existing system certification solutions. At the top of the pyramid, uh, you'll find that we have the BSI kite mark which as I mentioned earlier, we will be launching very shortly, which brings together those two components, but also looks um, at assessing how an organization is delivering uh, against, uh, against contract requirements. And that's an important point to consider. Uh, if you look at the slide, there are, you know, it's, there's a clear difference between differentiation and speed to compliance. And we've also been working with Digital Node um, to develop training uh, services to support the implementation of BIM, which we'll, uh, we'll talk about shortly. So a simple overview of the construction marketplace here you'll see on your screen from the, the, the top uh, where we have uh, clients, so particularly our engagement with UK government has been very important um, to, to uh, to ensure we build solutions that add value if you're looking to to um, procure uh, uh, projects and contractors. We've been working extensively with quite a number of the large tier one contractors to help shape both the kite mark and the verification uh, certification product and then we're also working with their supply chain partners um, because verification uh, is a very useful tool for helping with the engagement of supply chains to the main contractors. That's a simple overview of the marketplace. Um, just finally from, from me before I uh, hand over, uh, what you will see on the screen are some statistics that we regularly undertake um, surveys uh, with, with uh, our customers and the marketplace on the, the recognition and the strength of, of the BSI kite mark. Um, and I think the, the statistics really speak for themselves. It's uh, particularly in the construction sector, one of the best recognized certification uh, trademarks uh, in the marketplace. So this marks an exciting new phase of the kite mark for us as we move from products into the process of construction itself. Okay, so thank you, Andy, for all of that information. I hope people found that of interest to set the scene and explain what we've been working on. So, without uh, further ado, I'm now going to hand over to um, Barry Patterson. Uh, he's going to share with you the architecture of our verification, looking at the structure, the scope, 
and the assessment process. Hi there, my name is Gary Patterson. So I'm the certification manager for our um, Puzzle in 92 part, um, part two scheme. So just um, just a, a quick quick background. So so over the last two years, so Andy Butterfield, who, who you just heard from, and myself have been immersing ourselves in BIM and basically developing a scheme um, that, um, that we, we launched at the tail end of last year. So we're now at the stage now where we're, we're f fully fully running and um, good to go. So just a quick quick agenda of, of what I'd like to cover today. First of all, to give you some idea on the structure of the scheme, so how that how, how that's um, how it's been created. So um, so I'll, I'll go into a bit more detail than, than Andy um, has just, just talked about. Um, secondly, what what is the Certification fundamentally saying so if you receive a, a verification certificate from BSI against PASLIN 92 Part 2, what fundamentally is that is that telling the reader of that certificate? Okay. So uh, next we have the um, the scope of the assessment. So when when we come to to carry out an assessment, what 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 are we looking for? What what is actually covered in the assessment? And crucially, what isn't covered in the assessment? So so I'll, I'll be talking about that. Um, and also talking about how how our scheme is designed in such a way that it's, it's, it's relevant for both tier ones as well as the extended supply chain. So, so we've developed, the, we've structured the scheme in a way that, that we can provide solutions for, for both the tier ones as well as, as well as the specialist contractors and the um, M&E services providers. So that, that's something that we will talk about. Okay, uh, we'll talk about what evidence are we, we'll be looking for during the assessment. So, so what, what would we expect to see? How would you demonstrate that you're complying to particular clauses? Okay. Um, then we'll talk about the structure of the assessment. So that's that's the mechanics of it. So, how many days will it last, um, etc. Okay. Um, ongoing activities. So, um, once you've had your, your initial assessment and hopefully awarded your cert certification, what happens next? Okay, and then finally, I'll give you a little insight onto my assessment experience. So currently, I'm, I've conducted uh, a lot of assessments so far. So um, I, I just want to give you a bit, a bit of experience on that. Fundamentally, what, what, the, what the assessment is saying is that we're, we're saying that you, that you have the capability, capability here, to work in accordance with PAS 1192 Part Two, uh, and crucially, it needs to satisfy the PAS 1191 Table Eight requirements. As I said earlier, um, so the, the certification is about is in accordance to PAS 1192 Part Two, but that that also incorporates other other parts. So so crucially, the three main pillars that are included in the scope of verification are PAS 1192 Part Two, BS 1192, which is the talks about the common data environment and standard methods and procedures. So that's um, uh, naming conventions, status codes. And then BS 1192 Part 4, which is which is which is Colby deliverables. Okay, so they're the, they're, the, they're the three main components. So we see here from this slide here that this gives you a this the structure of the of the um, of the PAS itself, and the the assessment follows essentially follows that information delivery cycle. So so we look at we start from how you receive the EIR and how and all the way into how the uh, the project is actually handed over. Okay, so, this, uh, so we've looked at this slide already, but I just want to quickly recap. So we've got we've got this whole suite, this whole toolkit that, that defines UK government BIM level two. So one of the outcomes of the shaping session is that we should essentially take a modular approach in developing our schemes, which which is what Andy alluded to. So so of the three standards that I'll just say again, because it's really important, the three standards that are covered in the verification are BS 1192 Part Two, BS 1192, and BS 1192 Part Four. Okay, so. Um, but there are other requirements of uh, verification. So, in terms of classifications, uniclass, uniclass is something that we wouldn't stipulate the use of. What we what we would require require is that at project level there is an agreed classification system. That's an example. So, the CSE BIM protocol, that's something that we wouldn't we wouldn't require, but it's something that that we'd recommend that that, that, that's, that's of use. So, here's just a quick snapshot. I won't, I won't dwell on it of of of, of the, some of the standards and documentation that were in the, the previous previous screen. If we move to the next slide, this shows how we've broken it up into into uh, uh, the, the two schemes that we're working on. So so what we're talking about now is in the design construction phase. And as you can see, you've got the three main standards and then the supported documentation behind it. Okay, so this is just a uh, so we we appreciate that the organisations that BIM is applicable to is is very extensive, and that that your role within a BIM project may vary as well. So we we, we don't want to produce a, a certification scheme requirements 
that basically it's just, it's just suited for the tier ones, for example. So you can see on this list, which is from the BSLM92, that the types of organizations that BIM is actually applicable to. So the first thing we, that, that we would do, if, if you were with us, is to essentially determine where you fit into the supply chain, and that will, be, that will then tailor your assessment plan, scope of assessment, um, and your certificate that you'll eventually see, receive from BSI. Okay, so this, this is just a bit of background. I won't dwell on this. This, this is just um, essentially a, an, another understanding of what, what, what BIM is, look, is looking to achieve. It's essentially part two. So, it's, so it's, it's about delivering information in, 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 in a managed way. So you can see the boxes in the, on the right-hand side. So that, that basically gives another level of, of how we define BIM and, and what, we, what we'd look for and what the, what the certification is fundamentally saying. Okay, so you've, you've contacted us and we've determined your, your position within the supply chain. Next, we, we'll look at, so that will dictate your, your scope of assessment. So as I said, so we, we appreciate these differences in, in, in that. And you can see from the, the, um, these two tables, some of the differences that may, that may be applicable to different members of the supply chain. So, so the tier one, uh, crucially, you're responsible for the setting up and management of the CDE, whereas the, if you're a member of the extended supply chain, then you would need to be ensured that you're, you're compliant to the, the requirements of the project CDE, because remember, the, pro the CDE can change from project to project. What we look for is that the, the structure of the given CDE complies with the past. Okay, so, so you can have a look through some of these, some of these differences. So here's a uh, flow process of, of the, the assessment, and I'll, I'll go through this quickly. So you, you can see here that essentially we're, what we'll be assessing is, is the, these, are the, these are the core documents that need to be produced within the BIM project. So for tier ones, we'll be looking at your production of the BEP and how you ensure that corresponds to the compliance of the, the, the EIR. Um, and the production of the PIP, which, which, which includes the, 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 the assessment of your supply chain capability and that's done through the use of prescribed assessment reforms as you see in the bottom and as on the bottom there okay then we then move on to the post contract stage and that then uh, this again this is a tier one responsibility so the production of the post contract BEP okay and that will include the revised PIP and then the master information delivery plan so that's um, that that's basically the uh, the comprehensive um, guide of how how the project team is going to deliver the exact information deliverables that the client has required as per the EIR and, and then of course and that, that should be composed of all the respective task information delivery plans which uh, serve the same purpose but are at, at a supply chain level. And then finally once we've, once we've mobilized and uh, the project's underway so we'll be looking at the structure of the common data environment and, and making sure that complies with BS 1192 so we look, look at the four fundamental, fundamental areas um, and how that's managed, the, um, making sure that the deliverables are aligned to a particular plan of work, that could be Breva, but it, that doesn't have to be, um, and how, essentially how, how the information models are, are produced and managed collaboratively amongst the supply chain, okay? Okay, so here's a, here's a, a we, we went to each of the sections, we're zooming out now. So now I want to just have a talk about how the additional requirements that, 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 we've, do, that we've added to the schemes. We, we think we can, this, this, was, this was a result of the shaping session as well, we think we can strengthen the, the scheme requirements. So if, if we see here, so what we've done is we've seen that a lot of, a lot of what we're looking at, what we've just seen, actually is, is familiar fundamentally to 9001. So what we've done is we've extracted some of the key 9001 requirements as part of our verification scheme. Now crucially the first one is that all of the, all of the requirements I've just, talk, uh, I've just talked about need to be backed up with a controlled documented procedure. Okay, so that, that's crucial. That's the evidence we're looking for. That's, that's, that's how you demonstrate capability. That's how you ensure to us that what, what you do on a particular project is how you do it on every project. Okay, because as part of our scheme, we're not, we don't necessitate, necessitate that, that you've completed X amount of BIM projects. What, 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 we, what we ask for is how do you ensure that BIM projects are completed in a particular way, okay? Secondly, there's a documented complaints procedure. That's uh, self-explanatory. And secondly, that, or thirdly, that you've, you've identified, of all your internal BIM-related personnel, you've identified what are the, the core minimum competency requirements of each of those personnel and how, how you're measuring that competency requirements. That, 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 that's, that's very important. Okay, so now it's the, the structure of the assessment. Okay, so depending on the, whether you're tier one or supply chain, we always start with a one-day gap analysis visit, and the purpose of the gap is to, is to 
calibrate where you are and where you need to be in order to be compliant to the PAS for your stage two. Okay, and this 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 has been an value exercise. This, this is for us for you to know exactly what we're looking for. And there's no passing or failing of the gap. It's 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 purely for us to help you as much as possible without giving you the answers how you need should be compliant with the standard. Okay, so we then move on to the stage two. Okay, and and the gap between the, the gap and the stage two obviously depends on how you do on the gap, and depending on where you are, that will last between one and three days of um, and that's your stage two. Okay, and then the period of validity of your um, certificate is one year, and, and, and we think that's appropriate, particularly how new BIM is and, and, and how, how changeable these pre procedures are. So what we'd, what we'd require is that you would need a, a, an assessment every year, but the duration of that assessment would typically be not as long as your initial assessments. So here's a summary of what I've just talked about. Yeah, so and it, it, so, that, so here we, we're just identifying the key uh, 9001 requirements and the fact that it lasts it lasts one year. And that the, the core thing we're looking for is you have a, a documented procedure. That's 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 the crucial part of evidence that we're we're looking for. So what happens next? Okay, so once once you sign up, we can we we want we want to help you as much as possible in understanding what, what the requirements of the PAS are. So, of course, we'll give you your assessment plan, which you can see on the left here. That's an, an example of an assessment plan. So you'll know, you'll know how, how much time we want to focus on different aspects of the scheme and who we'd expect to be there. What, 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 what personnel would we expect to, to guide, us, guide us through each of the sections? And secondly, we can, we can essentially give you a, a tool that, 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 that we've produced that, that is a clause-by-clause -clause breakdown, a matrix of exactly what we're looking for as part part of the assessment. So, so you, you see, uh, basically a, a, a really helpful tool would be for yourself is to go through this assessment matrix systematically and work out and, and ensure that you can fulfill all the requirements and even map where they are in your um, documented system. That, that, that speeds along uh, assessments considerably. So lastly, I just want to give you some some background into um, my my experiences during, during, during assessments. And um, so firstly, the way in which we've structured the the, uh, the assessment, we want we want to allow as much flexibility for each of you, each of the organisations, whilst ensuring that the key uh, key of the required requirements of the of the of the scheme are met. So so that, that that that's important. Okay. So I've seen I've seen a lot of variation in how BEPs are produced, for example, and in, in, including that how 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 master and information delivery plans are, are produced and managed. Okay, that's important. Um, the, the types of solutions for the, the common data environment. I've, 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 I've seen a lot of variation there and, and, and the types of software that, that we're using. Um, uh, and, and, I, and I must say, for the organizations I've, I've assessed, um, I, I've, been, I've been really impressed with, with the, those I've dealt with so far and um, there's, 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 there's a lot of expertise there. But crucially at the moment, this, this expertise, is, and this is, this, is, this is across the UK, across the globe probably, is that the uh, the BIM expertise is centralised. So everyone's in this process of, of mass mobilising BIM expertise across the industry. Um, so that's something that that's something that we see. Last, lastly, uh, the how, how impressed I've been with with the, the, the tier ones in how how they're helping their their extended supply chains in, in this, this training, uh, as well as helping their clients. So uh, at the moment, we're we're still seeing that uh, some a lot of the EIRs that are produced in the project are are. Um, are not fit for purpose, so, the, so the, um, the tier ones are helping a lot with that. So that's that's essentially all I wanted to say there. Um, I can go into more detail at uh, another, another point, but I just want to pass back to, to Charlotte now. Thanks a lot. Okay, thanks, Gary. Um, so right, I'm now going to move on to um, why verification. You've heard all of that good information, and um, let's see what this really means for you. From the information clients have shared with us already, we can see that there are a series of advantages. And one of these is in connection with companies who are tendering for government contracts. April the 4th, 2016, already mentioned, is the first day that centrally procured public sector projects will require the implementation of BIM at level two. So for those who are bidding for public sector contracts, in the pre-qualification questionnaire, which is known as PAS 91, there is a section that asks you questions about building information modelling, your policy and capability. And the good news is that it also clearly states if you hold 30-party certification to PAS 1192 Part 2, you don't have to complete that specific section in the questionnaire. So in the first instance, it's a positive time-saving exercise for you when completing the PQQ. Now, when we look from a commercial perspective, 
there are significant other benefits. Not only is verification a time-saving tool, but by its very nature it can support your ability to win tenders. It gives you the evidence to prove that you adopted and embedded the correct processes or procedures and that you are compliant with PAS 1192 Part 2, so it could help you win public contracts. As a result of this, you could gain increased market share and be seen as the market leader ahead of your competitors. And verification can also help you deliver greater value to your clients who may be asking for digital information and your staff helping them to understand the procedures. It can help embed a new way of working possibly within your organisation. So, and in partnership with all of these lies the protection of your brand and reputation. And when we look at the supply chain efficiencies, these can be gained as you collaborate across di disciplines, helping you save costs and become a preferred supplier. And for tier two uh, contractors or specialist contractors, verification could form part of your evidence as to why a tier one organisation should choose to use your services. From a practical perspective, there are advantages to be gained too from verification. We've talked about speeding up the completion of pre-qualification questionnaires, and it can also bring the advantages of standardisation. PAS 1192 Part 2 gives you a standard naming conventions, level model definitions and recognised classification systems and verification on top of this sets the benchmark. So you're aligned with the rest of the industry and verification gives you clarity too on which clauses you need to meet for compliance. And by the very nature that you have to embed and provide evidence that these procedures are being adopted, it can help address your productivity issues. And as our assessors go in to review your procedures, we find that this helps to clarify your understanding of what the actual requirements are. So we've got the expertise to confirm whether you grasp the standard correctly, and then we can calibrate that using our experience as we understand what PAS 119 Part 2 is asking for. And finally, verification helps you embed procedures. As we ask for documented evidence, you can use this to ensure that procedures are followed not once, but every time. This next slide um, shows uh, two clients that we were absolutely delighted um, achieved verification back in December, Skanska and BAM. So just to put that little message out there that uh, we are working with Tier 1 organisations um, and many are already on that journey to achieving verification for PAS 1192 Part 2. So I'm now going to uh, hand over to Rebecca DiCicco and Rebecca joins us as I've said um, in Australia and Rebecca is going to talk you through the training solutions and a little bit about digital node as well um, so that you can see what is available to support you on this journey. So thank you to, um, to all the speakers so far, it's been a fantastic um, session today. So my name is Rebecca DiCicco and just to give you a little bit of background, um, I've been working um, in the UK for close to 10, 10 years um, in terms of uh, supporting both um, a digital workflow in construction and also um, in the design space. And more recently, I've uh, been the managing director of uh, my own consultancy, Digital Node. And the main intention for Digital Node is that we, uh, we look at training, managing and delivering services on a, a, a digitized front in terms of offering solutions to construction clients. So some of the um, some of the work that we've done so far has been um, quite varied. We've been working um, not only um, in industry to support clients in terms of some of the um, BIM workflow or training solutions, but also with universities and schools um, and institutions in terms of supporting not only training but um, delivering solutions for BIM and uh, and supporting projects. So currently, um, just a little bit of background in terms of my opinion on how uh, I'm seeing the industry at the moment is that there's a little bit of confusion surrounding not only where we sit in terms of a government mandate, but what these levels actually mean. If we look at the, uh, the diagram above, you can see that the definition for BIM can be, uh, can be defined in two different ways. And there's quite some confusion, not only for how we're defining that, but what that actually means in industry and what that actually means in terms of um, the solution for government, etc. So more recently, I have uh, Digital Net has partnered with BSI to ensure that we offer a training solution that not only aligns to to the um, the industry's current capability, but also aligns to where the industry needs to be moving um, forward in terms of uh, the government strategy, 
and some of the subsequent strategies that we've seen um, released in industries such as the industrial strategy, et cetera. And the training solutions that, um, that we are offering now um, on behalf of BSI align to those, uh, those objectives. So just, to, just to, uh, to begin with, I think it's really important to, to note that not only that these, these training solutions are aligned to the government strategy, but also they're aligning to the way that these standards have been uh, created, the way that the standards are started to address BIM, not only the ones that actually um, align to BIM, such as PAS 1192 or BS 1192, but also some of the other standards that have been mentioned previously today, such as um, ISO 9001 and, and BS 7000. So for those who aren't aware, the government uh, BIM task group have actually defined a BIM learning outcomes framework and the courses that we have created for and behalf of BSI align to the BIM learning outcomes framework. These learning outcomes provide a, a standard for industry to actually assess how uh, not only um, our industry will begin to train and up to, but also how education can begin to move forward and actually align to, to level two. And they were created by um, a series of support officers that were working with the central government to support training and upskilling for government departments. So not only do these um, courses align to where we need to be moving forward, but they also will be, be updated to, to look at some of the solutions for Level 3 BIM, which obviously we're not speaking about now, but it will start to, to move forward in the industry and actually move forward from October this year and, and look at new solutions. So the courses that, um, that we have created are aligning to the framework by actually um, offering a solution to not only implement BIM, but also to look at the fundamentals behind what BIM is, how we'll move through and look at some of the more kind of detailed processes and procedures that align to BIM, and then more importantly, how we're managing the information. And that's one area that we need to address quite heavily in terms of the way projects and clients understand BIM solutions. So one of the standalone courses that um, Digital Note have de developed for um, and on behalf of BSI is the implementation course. And this course is hopefully um, quite a, an appealing course to those who haven't actually started on their BIM journey yet. It is aligned to, um, to looking at not only how we can strategically implement BIM, but also the managing principles behind that and, and some of the te technology solutions. So this course also looks at some of, the, um, some of the ideas behind change management and how we can actually implement BIM within our organisations, regardless of what size or type of organisation um, you're involved in. So the BIM Fundamentals course uh, is a two-day course, and this course looks at not only um, what BIM is, so some of the basic terminology, and as Gary and Andy both, um, both mentioned earlier, you know, some of the terminology we've spoken about today, some of you may not be aware of or may not understand in detail. And the fundamentals course will look at what that actually means um, to construction, what is actually an EIR, a BEP, what constitutes an MIDP, etc. So the fundamentals course will pick up on the main, um, the main focus of what BIM is and, ha and how have actually aligned uh, the government solutions to what BIM Level 2 and defining that. The next two courses, so the processes and procedures course, very important because um, it, it breaks down not only where the the BIM offering is within the UK construction industry, but it, it also looks at the details behind how we're actually following through those processes and procedures as defined by the standards that have been delivered to industry. Now, there's been a lot of confusion surrounding how we actually implement um, the information um, delivery cycle and, and things like that that align to uh, the PAS documents, but also how we align not only the, the, the process um, for the supply chain, but also, um, the defined processes that must be um, adhered to by the client and what the actual client's um, achieving for their project. Our final course is the information management course, which breaks down not only how information is managed, obviously, but how we actually manage that information, what solutions do we need to do and put in place to actually begin to to break those apart and start to, to understand a little bit more about how information is managed on projects. And not only is this, um, I guess, in line with the client aspirations in PAS 1192 Part 3, um, as well as some of the other standards that are aligned to asset management and facilities management, but also this course uh, hopes to, uh, to, to offer a solution to the supply chain in terms of how they actually share, manage, control, 
and document that information. And not only is that important in in all areas of um, the supply chain, but actually post occupation and how we're actually managing that information once once we've delivered our construction projects, regardless of their type. Now these courses um, are um, quite um, aligned; they're heavily aligned to the Lending Outcomes Framework, as we've discussed. But they also uh, they also kind of are defined by not only a strategic uh, kind of top level implementation, but also managing uh, principles behind how we manage our information and our operational procedures. So they are aligned to um, to all areas of the construction industry and all industry professionals. And the opportunity we believe that will exist in terms of um, once you've actually attended these courses is that not only will you understand the basic fundamentals, not only will you be able to understand how to communicate um, you know, some of the acronyms, et cetera, that exists within the standards, but also you'll be able to promote uh, your organisation and be able to promote your organisation in terms of future opportunities, the industrial strategy, not only, not only the uh, construction, the government construction strategy, but both, uh, both strategies actually look at how we can offer a, a strong export opportunity for construction in the UK. And these courses will, will allow you to actually be able to do that. And, and with that, um, I'll hand back to, to Charlotte who will wrap up and, and hopefully we'll have some questions. Okay, so thank you, Rebecca. I hope that was useful information. Um, we've had a few questions that have come in. Um, and I would now like to um, ask um, Gary Patterson if he could answer a question for me around the common data environment. So I'm just going to pass the control over to Gary to help answer those questions. Okay, and the, the, the question is, do all BIM models need to be located in the common data environment uh, as, the wor as the work in progress model uh, for compliance with BSL and T? Or can the BIM models be worked on and distributed outside of the common data environment? Regarding the common data environment, it's, it's, so this, this, the structure of the common data environment is actually it's, it's quite flexible with the uh, PASL in 92 Part C. So crucially, what we, what we see in practice, the, 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 these conceptual areas, this, this work in progress area, shared, published, and archived, are essentially just, just controlled through the use of, of metadata. And the, uh, so with the, with the Shared, published, and, and archived. These need to be these need to be controlled at a tier one level, or at a, a, a you know by by a, a client representative. So this, these need to be centralised. With the work in progress area, they, these definitely don't have to be part of the centralised common data environment. So the so the whole point of the work in progress areas are each of the respective uh, supply chain members will work on their on, on their models within their own systems. And the, and, and, and the status of these models will always have the status got a bit S0. So, that, so, that, so um, these, they haven't been verified and they're not fit for coordination. So, so models, models can definitely be worked on outside the, outside the shared area. But you have to remember, this, the, the way the PAS LM92 defines the um, common data environment is that they, okay, so they, they define the work in progress areas to be part of the CDE. But in, in reality, these, 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 these parts, they're, they're different platforms, they're different software. And another important note is that the different areas of the, of the CDE may, may be in, on completely different platforms. Is, and that's, that's something that I, that, that I see quite frequently. So but what's important is that the, 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 the CDE take, take into account all, all the softwares that, that, that may be being used is, contr is controlled. So there's, there's no duplication of models. So if a model has a suitability code of S2, there's there's no way in which that that model can be duplicated, and uh, it's it's um, and and uh, the coordination controls are in place. I hope that answers your question. Um, okay. So I'd also like to walk you through um, the support that's available um, from us here at BSI. First of all, um, obviously starting at the beginning for those who uh, haven't yet done so, if you want to visit um, bsigroup.com, we have a dedicated web page for our BIM certification and uh, training solutions. Um, we'd highly recommend that you visit the BSI shop where there's a full suite of BIM standards which are available for you to download. Um, we have, as Rebecca has walked you through, our BIM training courses um, and there is a dedicated page about that um, with a useful brochure that gives you the full suite of everything that is currently available. 
If you want to uh, book your gap analysis, that would be the next stage of your journey and you might want additional training after that point if you find that there is um, information that you uh, don't have within your business and more education is required. We would then complete an assessment as Gary has walked you through some of that information today and all being well, uh, presuming that it is all as uh, we would hope it to be, then you will achieve verification to PAS 1192 Part 2. And the uh, marketing um, lozenge you can see on the right hand side is what you would receive to help you promote um, your achievement. And that's what our Tier 1 organisations are already taking advantage of, who, those who've achieved verification already. Okay, and further support. This is some useful information. We have um, a brochure which walks you through um, the whole structure. And we have another guide as well, which is called Taking the Next Steps. And that's really for people who, if you're fully involved with BIM, but you want to share information up to perhaps senior management, um, there are some useful um, pointers in there. And if you are actually undertaking the BIM procedures yourself, then there's information in there for you as well. These are what our training pages look like, useful fact sheets about each of the specific courses for you to download and share with colleagues. So in summary, um, we would recommend that you start your journey now to gain the commercial and efficiency uh, benefits. We can support you along this journey. Please consider the training options that we've walked you through today. Our BSI BIM team um, are very keen to talk to you and help you through and understand the processes and what you need to do. Um, we also have our pages, as I've mentioned, and um, at the end of this um, uh, presentation, we will be sending you these slides with a link to a video which we have just completed, um, which talks through from our Tier 1 organisations, both Skanska, BAM, and then input from other companies such as Bechtel and um, Balfour BT, exactly what the value of verification means to them and what it means for their supply chain. So hopefully that will be uh, interesting viewing for you as well. So without further ado, I'd just like to say thank you to everybody. Thank you for our panellists for taking the time to join us today. So thank you very much. I hope it's been a, a good session.